Hello, my friends. This is Deepak Chopra, and I am very honored, thrilled, privileged to have a very special guest today. And her name is Nancy Du Duterte. Is did I pronounce it correctly, Nancy? Good enough. It's technically it's Duterte, but nobody ever gets it. So Duterte, Duterte, whatever. I tell people I answer to two turtles if they really you know, if all else fails. So do two trade. Is that good enough? Sure. Okay, Nancy. So, you know, I, I'm also a skeptical guy by nature. Mm -hmm. and therefore, when I, uh, when I saw the subtitle and, uh, you know, your name as the skeptical psychic, uh, I was very intrigued. So I started to read the book and I find it very interesting and I find your participation in that group of crazy people that we have uh, very interesting <laughs> as well. so let's start simply by um, this term the skeptical psychic i read about your background but you know a lot of people that we're reaching right now um, probably don't know who you are a lot of people uh, that we're reaching right now may not know who I am, but we ultimately reach about 15 million people over the course of some time. So in order for us to reach those people, we have to tell them a little bit about not only the subject of discussion, but the person we are speaking to. So um, I want our audience to know a little bit about you. Where were you born, where you grew up, your childhood a little bit, and how did you get to here? Oh my goodness, that's like but a- you don't have to be, don't, don't, you have to go into details, but obviously we need to know where you're coming from. Okay, well, I was uh, born in New Haven, Connecticut, while my father was at Yale Medical School we then moved roughly every two years of my life. So I have lived all over the United States. I have lived in England, France, and Germany as well. Um, I came from a very, very academic family. My father was a medical uh, researcher. So as a little girl, instead of going to go visit my father's you know, office, I would go to laboratories that had the big radiation signs over them, and I would watch him do operations on rats, giant frogs, sheep, cats, dogs, uh, you name it. Uh, so there, I, I came from that background. Nobody believed in my family, even to this day, on both sides, in anything psychic, um, or anything even, uh, well, certainly not anything um, UFO related or ET related. Uh, so this has been a tremendous voyage for me. I then I went on, uh, I went to college, uh, went to Princeton, went after that, uh, ran, owned and operated a bunch of businesses, including a printing company, a healthcare industry newspaper, a 242 bed skilled nursing home, a uh, French porcelain factory. I also then went to law school, uh, became an attorney, practiced securities litigation and corporate law in New York City for close to a decade. And at some point did a very strange detour in my life and decided that I wanted to investigate or research the, uh, the science, if there was any, of intuition. And what I discovered was that, at least at that point, and I'm going back a couple of decades now, um, psychologists weren't particularly interested because in the dyad type of relationship, it's the psych psychotherapist, the psychiatrist, uh, who is always the authority and directing the course of the treatment, the therapy, the conversation, whatever. So they don't like to give that up. And you certainly have to give it up if you're going to go and acknowledge the power of intuition. So they weren't interested. I studied a bunch of neuroscience. I thought maybe those guys would be able to at least tell me something about the structure, the architecture of intuition. 
and they were not interested, at least at that time. I know that there's been an increasing movement towards um, understanding the subjective components of intuition since then uh, and, and consciousness. Um, and then after that, I just thought, well, the heck with it. I'm going to go talk to anybody I can talk to who can tell me anything at all about uh, intuition. And that's when I finally, for the first time in my life, I met um, psychics, spiritual mediums, medical intuitives, psychic detectives, um, you name it. I, I was all over the place. Um, and then I began training. I trained for a decade as a psychic detective. Uh, I trained in spiritual mediumship with the spiritualist church. Uh, I trained as a remote viewer. I now teach my own brand of remote viewing that I call TSP. And um, it's that's sort of where I am now. So that's that's the real quick and dirty update on, on my life. That, that's very good. So I'm speaking to um, Nancy Guterrick. Her book is Psychic Intuition. She calls herself or used to call herself the skeptical psychic, or maybe she should continue with that uh, title. And skepticism is a very healthy way to investigate reality. It's the opposite of cynicism, which means you made up your mind. Um, skepticism means you're open to possibilities and exploring reality beyond your conditioned or habitual certainties. So Nancy mentioned that she started a journey because she was interested in intuition. A lot of people ask, what is intuition? And the way I've thought about intuition is that it's another mode of knowing, which is more contextual, more relational, more holistic, doesn't have a windows orientation, and is eavesdropping on something that's in the background of our habitual perceptions and interpretation of our habitual perceptions. Would you agree with that uh, definition of intuition? Oh my goodness, I've never heard it put quite that way. That's interesting, eavesdropping. Um, I don't know whether it's eavesdropping. I, I mean, for me, uh, intuition is simply an expansion of our existing perceptual capabilities. Correct. So for me, it's it's inclusive. It's not one observing the other or listening into or whatever. I just think that our our physical body um, dominates our ability to collect and gather data of, about our environment and about everything. So um, and and in the same way that you have, um, uh, if you have too many different uh, stimuli coming in. In the, in the nervous system, they're, they're channel blockers. And it's gonna be your, your sort of most, it's the loud, it's sort of the, the squeaky wheel that gets the attention. It's gonna be your loudest uh, perceptual input that's gonna grab your conscious awareness. So I think that's what mostly we get stuck with because we have a physical body. So we're stuck with our loudest um, perceptions that, that come to us. I totally agree with that and your definitions are as good as they get. Uh, all I'm saying is that um, intuition is in fact what governs even our ordinary perception. We choose our ordinary perceptions based on context, meaning, relationships, past experiences, memories, anticipation, desires, imagination, intuition is all part of that background that is surfacing as the experience of the five perceptions through which we experience our body. There's no such thing as a body. It's just a modulation of perceptions, sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts that we call the body. I had a body that was once a fertilized egg, then a zygote, then an embryo, then a baby, then a toddler. So there's no such thing as a body. It's just a changing perception in the same way as intuition is, but this is, looks very solid. So it's, there it is, it, but it, it, it's still an illusion. But never mind, these are nuances. The point is you got 
to the understanding that what you call psychic phenomena, extrasensory perception, paranormal, is actually normal. And mm -hmm. that uh, it is, uh, in fact, um, based on an understanding of the normal as well. If you don't understand ordinary perception, how are you going to understand extrasensory perception? And so at least what I got from this book is that uh, there's a continuum. Perception, this, what I'm experiencing right now, you, me, television screen, furniture in my room, the virtual background that you have. All this is being experienced right now on the level of perception in the space that we call awareness. Of course, we can also call it cyberspace at the moment, but it's still the space of awareness. Cyberspace is the, the bandwidth of experience in which we are having this perceptual activity. You, me, and all the people across the world who are watching us. So this, we are all in that space right now, in this space of awareness. Now, what you're saying is, we don't need Zoom to, or, or this technology to access this space. We can access it um, by going inward. Am I correct or not? Yes, and I, I think that Moore's, well, first of all, I don't know whether you can access it as directly with as much detail as you can on Zoom, for example. Okay, because as anybody who's been in the field of, you know, clairvoyance or, or remote viewing or any of that kind of stuff, you, you know that there's no such thing as 100% accurate. Um, it, it's just the way it is. Um, what was I going to say here? Okay. You, you made a very good point. The more accurate, by the way, it is, the less reliable it is. The more accurate this it, it is, the more clear it is, the less reliable it is because it's ignoring the cloud of probabilities that it already exists in order to manifest as this. So in my tradition, the Eastern wisdom traditions, every experience has four levels. Para, which means totally unmanifest. Pashanti, the cloud of probabilities. Madhyama, the clarity of the internal dialogue and Vekri, what I perceive. But what I perceive is a space-time event selected out of this whole infinite range of possibilities. So I'm totally on board with what you're saying. Uh, I, I think enough of the theory. Now I want to talk about your experiences. So talk about the experiences in this book. Let's forget the theory. And uh, you have a virtual background uh, over there. Uh, you can display the book, do that with your virtual background, if you don't mind. And you have, you have this book, you, uh, you manifested it right there. And now you have another book. Uh, can you show that as well? Sure. Okay. And then we have Nancy herself. All this is virtual reality. All of this is virtual reality right now. And today we are speaking about this virtual reality with that virtual reality and this virtual reality and everybody virtually on Zoom. So we are already in a virtual world. And what Nancy is saying is when you go deeper into this virtual world, into the cloud of probabilities existing in the field of infinite possibilities, then you have access to some of the adventures she has had, which she describes in this book. And a little bit to your point, um, what in, in, in this, um, these various groups of um, very illustrious scientists that you and I both seem to be uh, having conversations with. Oh, we are just entangled with them, that's all. We're entangled with them, that's good yeah. enough. And my frustration is always to explain, and I do explain it in my book, Psychic Intuition, that people who are intellectual, academic, who are uh, logical, analytical, the people that we consider maybe some of the smartest people in the world have a problem. 
they cannot access this kind of information because it completely uh, it, it is the almost the polar opposite of what they have been trained to do and trained to think from the day that they started learning how to speak languages, which is logical, sequential, uh, analytical. You can you can uh, back engineer it. You can do all those things that we love about the intellect in order to do this kind of work, which by the way, is highly intellectual, but not in the normal context that we normally think of it. You have to uh, take what you consider to be knowledge and set it aside. You have to experience the world completely as it comes to you in, in, a, in a highly literal way. Um, and then you, you start to feel your way around there. Because once you start to do that, and that was sort of my voyage uh, over several decades, was to learn how to get out of my academic frame of mind, which I thought was the right way to go, because everybody tells you that. And uh, it was to get into this world of, of what I used to think was fuzzy thinking and not very good thinking. But what you're doing is you're expanding all the portals of possibility. It's exactly what you're talking about. These sort of these quantum possibilities, and um, once you you start to do that, um, it, it's astounding. It's absolutely astounding what starts to happen to you. You begin to experience stuff that never in a million years you thought that you would ever experience. And by the way, I used to think that that. Um, people who were psychics, they had to be born that way, or they had to grow up in a family of psychics or whatever. That's not it at all. It is transforming the way that you think. And once you do that, you're not being sloppy at all, but you're opening yourself up to possibilities without dismissing them or basing what you think based on prefabricated ideas that you have slowly over the course of a lifetime acquired. And what they do is they close and close and close and close your portals of perception. If you open those, I mean, all of a sudden, I, I mean, I could tell you uh, uh, many, many crazy stories about what's happened to me since I began doing this. Um, and and I'll, but they're not just subjective, you know, well, you know, I think I saw or whatever. These are things that are either, they're documented, they're witnessed by others or their physical realities. I'll give you maybe one of the, the sharpest examples. Um, I became interested in psychokinesis. I don't know whether that's something that you, do you practice that? I have, yes, but I'd like to know more about it. And it's the one of the most difficult things to practice. So please share your story. Um, well, I was- um, By the way, Right yeah. now, we are practicing psychokinesis. I'm moving the molecules in your brain. Uh, just as this conversation is happening, you're moving mine uh, in here, electrochemical activities occurring. And everybody who's listening to us is also experiencing that. So we are all right now in a psychokinetic matrix at this moment, um, except it's very subtle. Uh, and our bodies are being regulated and regulating each other. I'm regulating yours and you're regulating mine. I'm monitoring yours and I'm, you're monitoring mine and we're uh, all at the same time influencing millions of people. So we are in part of a psychokinetic uh, um, matrix all the time. Anyway, we're altering the space-time geometry of the universe just by having this conversation. But that's a very deep level, but I, uh, your psychokinesis means I can um, influence the movement of this with my thoughts. And actually I can through technology already uh, with remote control, we do that, right? We uh, influence, I can open my garage door and shut off the uh, computer, open the television set. So we are practicing psychokinesis through a different kind of thinking that kind of thinking that we call scientific thinking or we call it, but we are actually using mind right now to affect the mind of the matrix. Uh, so psychokinesis is happening all the time, but you're talking about something even more obvious. Uh, and I'd love to hear your story. Well, it's 
interesting what you just said because well first of all that acknowledges absolutely that we're all connected and I, and by that i mean living and non-living which maybe some people would disagree with but i believe that um and i believe that a form of psychokinesis is um you know i, I do uh, medical intuitive and, uh, and energy healing work and part of that and, and people tell me very strange things they will i don't touch anybody ever at, at most, I, I use my hands maybe five or six inches above the surface of their body. I never touch anybody. And I could do this remotely also, but um, uh, people have told me that they've gotten massive electrical shocks. They can feel tingling. Of course, they feel heat. They feel pins and needles. Some people have told me they can feel tendons moving. Uh, they're, they're major, and I don't, I'm not doing any type of suggestive talking or anything when I'm doing this. These are simply what they come up with. So medical intuitive work, energy healing is a form of psychokinesis. So uh, if you are doing that and literally you're not uh, physically contacting or implanting conversation, you know, through physical speech, any types of ideas, that's a form of psychokinesis. There are many forms of it, many, many forms. I think the most dramatic form that I ever had, I was, um, uh, just a few years ago, I was in a uh, remote viewing um, conference and they decided to throw what's known as a PK party, uh, psychokinesis party, which is fairly common. I never understood this among remote viewers. Of course, I do understand it now. Um, and so the, um, is a, is a computational physicist, Marty Rosenblatt had taken uh, a big bag full of spoons and forks and things like that. You, and poured them out on the coffee table. And he said, well, you know, and I also went to Home Depot and I bought these, um, these steel rods. They're used in concrete reinforcement. And I have determined they are completely unbendable by any form of human strength. And because I had been bending all kinds of metal, you know, spoons and forks and all kinds of things for quite a while, I thought, well, let me try that. Cause I know, I know for sure, I cannot do that. So I took it and I, I held it gently and uh, in 10 minutes, it melted it, and I bent the entire thing in half. And I, I think like with most of this stuff, I was more astounded than anybody else. How can you bet, you can't get a more concrete example. I mean, yes, you can spin things. I mean, I do that too. You can move things. You can you can have these uh, other types of PK. But to me, it's it's literally it's what we all in in society consider to be a superpower. It's not. We all have that power, and it is simply our ability, I think, to um, to rearrange molecules, which I think we can do. Um, and I think through certain powers of, it's a combination of attention and inattention, but you, you have to initially set your focus. That's sort of your, your laser beam of you know, finding whatever your target is. Um, and I think that we can do that. I think there are so many things that we consider to be superhuman that are absolutely natural human abilities. It, it's, it's amazing that people haven't figured this out, but if they only think logically, like, you know, you can't do it, therefore it won't happen. And that's where some of this mindset stuff has to change with our highest level of academics. So let's go a little deeper into that because I'm going to explore an idea with you right now. Sure. And then uh, we can make it even more, uh, more logical than it seems to be <laughs> okay so when i lift my hand in a way that is psychokinesis because i start with a thought which presumably is not in the physical world and then this happens which presumably is in the physical world and this is part of as you know in that crazy circle of psychics and psychotics and scientists and sages and geniuses. Um, 
there are all kinds of opinions about the heart problem of consciousness. Never mind that, but the fact that I can start with a thought and lift my arm up, um, that's obvious, okay? So the thought and the physical activity are somehow connected, um, but science can't explain the first step. How does the thought start the action potential? After that, it's all very easy, but the first step, how does the thought start the brain activity? That's part of the heart problem. And the solution to the heart problem is there's no heart problem. It's all made of consciousness. The thought is made of consciousness. The perception is made of consciousness. It's all one unified phenomenon. And it is psychokinesis already. Now I lift this. And for some reason, this is not considered psychokinesis. Uh, it's obvious, you know, this is what I do all the time. I take it for granted. Now I talked to some scientists recently who've gone beyond the level of molecules and, um, and uh, into the whole realm of force fields. This is one scientist I interviewed yesterday. Uh, what is science? Don de Gracia. He's a professor of physiology at a university, a medical school. But he's also interested in um, phenomena like you and I are talking about. Also interested in understanding fundamental reality. And what he said to me yesterday, and I've talked to many other scientists about this. Nobody will argue with what I'm about to share with you right now. So when I touch this, I have no, I have no direct contact with this. When I touch this, I have no direct contact with this. Actually, electrons are, are bouncing off electrons. Force fields are bouncing. And even though I think I'm touching it, actually, no, I'm touching a force field a resistance field between two electrons. Mm -hmm. When I walk on the floor, I'm actually not, I'm levitating, I'm floating on the floor, even though the, the, the margin between the actual touch, which never happens by the way, the actual touch never happens. There's only resistance between force fields. It's mass spin charge. That's what's happening. Okay, now I'm interpreting that as direct contact, but there's no direct contact. So when I lift this, that's pure psychic, pure psychokinesis, literally pure psychokinesis, because I'm using force fields, which are part of my consciousness field to influence the force field here. So through technology, but also through regular locomotion and through regular interaction with what I call the physical world, it's all part of the psychokinesis anyway. It's all psychokinesis. Mm -hmm. However, what you're talking about is removing the filters, intellectual filters that say, I actually touch anything. We never touch anything. You know, now, now I spoke about this at the level of touch, but you don't even touch photons. When you look at this, you don't actually, the bulk of the information is inside here all you're seeing is a reflection, which is very marginal. So everything we perceive, whether it's molecules or atoms or force fields or images or thoughts, it's all indirect. It's all, it's actually inferential that I'm touching, but the touching is inferential. The reality is we are participants in the matrix of force fields, which scientists call force fields, but they're not force fields. They're human modes of knowing and conception to human experience that then we create these models, force fields, atoms, molecules, bosons, Higgs particles, human constructs to explain what is fundamentally an experience in consciousness, a cognition of a perceptual reality, which is unreliable anyway, because, you know, my perceptual reality is human. It's not what you mentioned in your other book, The Aliens. It's not the same thing as the perceptual reality of a bat, which knows the world as the echo of ultrasound, or a chameleon whose eyeballs swivel on two different axes, or uh, a snake that navigates through infrared, or a butterfly that navigates through um, presumably um, ultraviolet. It's all 
it's all made up. This whole physical world is a made up world based on a narrow band of human perceptual activity and a cognitive interpretation of it. And it's all, it's all our own projection. So we can choose our projections. And when we remove the filters of certainty that this is real, that's real, and my thought is not real, then we have access to this. So in, in the Indian tradition, by the way, one word for reality and a preferable word is existence. Anything that exists is part of existence, a thought, an image, a feeling, an intuition. You said fuzzy thinking. Actually, fuzzy thinking is creative thinking. Without fuzzy thinking, there's no creativity. You become an algorithm. <laughs> you know, The only clear, clear thinking is algorithms. That's it, the yeah. created by human beings. Yep. So, so I then, totally agree. these experiences that you mention are very important, that you can bend a spoon, you can move objects, because we are already doing that at a subtle level. And what you're showing is we can do it at the level of ordinary perception. Yes, I agree with everything you said. And I think it's so fascinating with our our, our friends in our in our various groups that we participate sort of with um, that they there are constant arguments and debates and they're endless about which theories which modalities which methodologies should be the superior or the governing one for all of our reality and I find it extraordinary that people don't seem to really uh, go the next step, which is what you're doing, is taking the next step backwards, which is everything is, a, is an artificial construct, absolutely everything. So all we've done in our lifetime with all of our perceptions is to um, build them into a system that works for us so that we can navigate somehow our lives by making predictions which have a fairly good possibility of happening. I mean, it's, it, the way I look at it, it's, it's sort of a, it's a survival thing. I don't claim to know, you know, why we need to survive or if we need to survive in the physical body, whatever that is. Uh, but it's having these systems helps us to navigate and that's it. But they're not for real. I totally agree with you. And you can manipulate them if you open your yourself up to the possibility that they are not the end all and the be all of everything that we know. And yes, thoughts are things so also. Me, um, because we could talk forever. Uh, let me just for our viewers say, get your opinion. Yes and no with a little bit of a uh, little bit of commentary if you want, but predominantly yes and no. Um, in the next part of our conversation. So first question, out of body experiences, are they real? Um, I have a real problem with that because people, t I have always said, well, I've never had one. And then I tell people what I experience in terms of dreams or other types of experiences. And they say, yes, that is one. In fact, my mentor, Ingo Swan, who created remote viewing with Hal Putoff and Russell Targ back in the early 70s, I asked him once about out of body and I told him about a dream where I had flown through several walls and things in New York to go visit him. He said, yes, that's an out of body. I don't claim to know what an out of body is. So I can't answer that. Okay. So now my response to that is I can't claim to know what an in body experience is either. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I don't think anybody can explain an in body experience because there's no one inside that body when you go looking for that person. <laughs> so, yeah. okay. Okay. Second question. Have you experienced remote viewing? Oh, sure. Yes, many times. Have you, have you bent objects from a distance? You? From a distance? Or, or without touching them? Like spoons moving, this, that, the other. No, that I've that's an interesting question. I don't know that I have. I usually have to touch them slightly. 
Uh, you can make other things, you know, pinwheels and, and other things move. You can make them move and spin and do all kinds of stuff without touching them. That I've done. What about remote healing? Is that a true phenomenon? Uh, yeah, it happens. Sure. Yeah. Some people look at a picture in my you know I've met people who look at a photograph and they can tell whether that person is alive or dead by just looking at the photo that's one of the uh, things that I used to do I used to teach psychic uh, development and mediumship that was one of my uh, my little exercises but yeah uh -huh. contact with people who have passed sure you say this as if it is just regular experience right but you say it's just part of reality, right? Will you give me, can I tell you a story? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, this was many years ago. Now, my eyes have always been bad. I have uh, cataracts, which I just recently had removed. I've got glaucoma, I've got floaters. I'm so nearsighted that what a normal person with 20 20 vision sees 20 feet away. Uh, I would, it would be the equivalent of if I looked at it from two football fields away, very, very, almost legally blind at any rate. Uh, so my eyes have always been an issue. I had, so I've always seen my ophthalmologist regularly, whatever, but you get older and your eyes kind of stabilize. I had a dream that I went to pick up my daughter. It was a very boring dream, pick her up at a, uh, after school, she was playing soccer or something. So I go to pick her up at some neighboring school. I walk in, I get her. And all of a sudden, my Swedish grandfather opens the door. He's long since deceased. And I said- yeah, I see him as if he's real. Oh, sure, he was in my dream. I, I'm a lucid dreamer also. Uh, I'm, and I remember most of my dreams. Are we in a lucid dream right now? Is this a lucid dream? Well, that's a good question. Yes, I, uh, because in many respects, I've, the, the older I've gotten, the, my sense of where am I has become almost a 50-50 between my sleeping dreams and my waking life. So I'm not quite sure. So I would say probably yes. Yeah, because what happened five minutes ago or a second ago is already a dream, right? What happened to the moment that we call now? What happened to these words by the time you heard them? They're part of a dream. Exactly. Okay, go ahead. I did not. Uh... That's okay. So we used to call him Puff. My grandparents were Muff and Puff. And so I said, Puff, what are, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I came to see you. And he had, had long since passed away. And I said, oh, okay. And he said, now there's something you need to know. And I said, what? And he takes this big tome, this big book, and he opens it up, it's about this thick. And he says, read this. And I said, Puff, you know, I can't read it. I'm in a dream. He said, fine. And he shows me some uh, illustrations, they're medical illustrations of, and I knew immediately it was ophthalmology. And he said, you need to go see your ophthalmologist. And I said, well, I don't think so, but thank you. We hugged and he, we said goodbye. And I woke up crying for joy, first and only time in my life. And I thought, well, since I'm exploring these sort of strange realms, uh, why don't I just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll humor this idea. I know that I don't have any changes in my eyes. I got no problems with my eyes, nothing. And I went and I saw my ophthalmologist. And for the first time in my life, he said, you have glaucoma and for the rest of your life, you have to come uh, every three months to get tested and you need drops. So my deceased grandfather Puff has saved me from blindness. Amazing. Well, that's a great story. So I've been speaking to Nancy uh, Dutetre. Her book is Psychic Intuition, everything you ever wanted to ask but were afraid to know. Uh, she's known as the skeptical psychic. Let me read the chapter headings. Look, chapter one, the impossible is real. Chapter two, don't ignore diamonds in the rough. Chapter three, faulty questions produce bad answers. Chapter four, the sliding scale of intuition includes psychic ability. Chapter five, we can see the invisible world. Chapter six, the sixth sense is a myth. 
Chapter seven, like it or not, women's intuition is better. I, I believe that. Chapter eight, pattern blindness, the antidote to nonsense. Chapter nine, beware the double-edged sword of words. Chapter 10, skeptics have hidden biases in logic and on and on. There are 18 chapters, all amazingly, lucidly, beautifully written. Some of my favorites, psychic taste and smell before defy the laws of science. Psychics and autistic savants have instant knowing. Psychics and synesthetes speak the language of the senses. So Nancy, uh, I believe, uh, first of all, amazing book, congratulations. Can we see your second book right now, but the, the one that we will explore later, how to talk to an alien. Okay, we'll explore that. Um, but in the meanwhile, are you open theoretically to a series of conversations, either as a podcast or on social media or YouTube or wherever, on each of these chapters? That would make, uh, first of all, it would be great for your book. But secondly, I think a lot of people would learn a lot. And so would I. If you are amenable to that, let me explore it. What do you think? Deepak, of course I'm amenable to that. Thank you. No, I, I think we need to show the world that what we call the extraordinary is actually as extraordinary as the ordinary. <laughs> the, 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 the ordinary is not ordinary. It, the ordinary is extraordinary. I totally agree with you. I would be phenomenally grateful. Okay, oh. Let's, let, let me look into that. Meanwhile, Carolyn, the uh, title is Psychic Intuition and the subtitle, but also Nancy's uh, description of herself. The skeptical psychic. I think I like that a lot. And then we'll be in touch and we'll send you this uh, when it's published and we'll promote it. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Me too. Thank you. Thank God you. bless. Bye bye. Bye bye. Carolyn, are you there? I hear. I got it, Deepak. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. You're welcome. I think you should put um, psychic intuition and you put all that there but the extraordinary is the ordinary i like how you said that put that too do whatever but include everything else too. yeah That's i will i'll i'll get okay. the book front. okay okay. okay the only other thing you yeah. have oh, did i stop let me stop yeah.